by the end of the course, uh, my, my, I forget the number of properties, but the, the, the valuation was 1.19 million yeah. um, with 114,000 pounds worth of income. Yeah. You know, I had to use my network really. So yeah. the first property I bought was with three other people. And that was because yeah. I was concerned that with having no, no job anymore, that I might not be viable for a mortgage. Yeah. One of the key things you told me was tell everybody what you do, which I didn't want to do that. I worked at Cadbury and I <laughs> So hello and welcome to our latest 100 Club interview and I'm really pleased today I'm with Greg Reed. Now these interviews are all about people who've managed to generate an in excess of £100,000 profit every single year from their property portfolio and Greg was actually able to do that within the 12 months on the Property Mastermind program so I'm sure you're going to get massive inspiration, pick up loads of golden nuggets from Greg as well. So welcome Greg. Thank you. Hello everybody. So thank you so much for agreeing to come on and do this interview, Greg. Really appreciate that. Just so people know, just tell us a little bit about, you know, where you're from and a little bit about you, and then we'll dive into the property stuff. Cool. Yeah. So as will become apparent from my accent, I am from Birmingham. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, been all my life pretty much. Uh, so yeah, I'm a local investor to Birmingham. And I, before property, I, I worked at Cadbury for quite a few yeah, years. Which is how we know each other. Which is how we met. Yeah, absolutely. You, so, you joined in 94, the year before me, didn't you, I think? That's right. Yeah, yeah. I was in it before you, uh, and you joined the same year as my wife, Jane. Yes, exactly. Um, so we, got, we have got a good connection, which was really handy for me, actually. Um, yes. Because, as you know, when I was thinking of getting into property, it was only because I knew you, um, yeah. and I knew I could trust you, that uh, I came to you, having had a few bad experiences before. But yes. yeah, I was in the corporate world for the best part of 20 years. Um, yeah. And, and, and you, you, I think you did what I expected to do when I came to Cadbury's. I kind of thought, right, brilliant company. You know, it, it, it was a great company, great yeah. people, great product. Yeah. And I kind of thought, right, I'm here for life now. That's yes. what I'd kind of expect to go to university, get a good degree, get a great job. Um, but obviously after several years, as you know, I, I got into property and was able to leave in 2001. Yeah. That was my property and my part-time club business. Yeah. Um, and, it's, uh, and then uh, by 2003, I'd completely replaced my income. So it took me eight years to do that. And then obviously you left after 20 years. So your final income was a lot higher than mine. And, yeah. and you got really to the top of the corporate tree in Cadbury's, hadn't you? Pretty much, yeah. 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 It was, I was head of chocolate supply for UK and Ireland. Um, yeah. And the next move was a directorship role, which yeah. um, I needed to move sideways to get a bit more breadth. But then that was the kind of plan. And yeah. so at the time where I left after 20 years, it was, it was a point where Cadbury were taken over by Kraft. And yeah. um, only because I knew I had this ambition to get into property was I able to leave at that time yeah. by reorganizing, restructuring my team as part of a bigger restructure, yeah. which really stopped me having to go to Switzerland, which would have been the next leg of the development for me. So it was a no brainer for me, having been there 20 years and dabbled in property to be able to kind of learn what I learned from you. Yeah. Um, and that gave me the ability and the confidence really to leave a really well paid job. Yeah. Family, um, to then go and really, really go out there and see what I could do. Fantastic. So obviously uh, you came on uh, with Jane, uh, your wife and my friend yeah. from Gabriel's. Yeah. With our accelerator course. Yeah. And then after that, you decide to come and do Mastermind. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's quite a big decision to do. It's, you know, it's a time commitment, a financial commitment. Yeah, massive. Yeah, massive. Um, tell, us, tell us a little bit about um, um, what strategies you focused on when you were in, in, that, in that year. Yeah, so it was clear that for me, um, I was lucky when I left Cadbury to have got a redundancy. And because I was at a, a good level, I got six months yeah. of redundancy. So I knew pretty much I had six months to, to kind of not cock this up. Um, yeah. And for me, replacement cash flow was really important. So it had to be HMOs, um, yeah. which was at the time a well understood strategy, but there was a good need for really good properties in pretty much all of the areas of the UK at the time and, and where I was in Birmingham it was a desperate need for good yeah. quality HMO. So yeah, cash flow and the fact that, that it was a proven strategy, but not too many people were doing it meant that yeah. I could get into that and I focused on that. But yeah. I, I had a mindset, Simon, that was moving from corporate world. If I'm going to be a professional investor and that's how I looked at myself now, then I wanted to employ all the strategies you taught on the program. Yeah. So it wasn't just a case of, 
having HMOs only. It was HMOs, but how else could I make money through options, through doing yeah. joint venture partnerships, through flip deals if it was appropriate and didn't fit my strategy, which yeah. is HMOs. I wanted to maximize my network, but also yeah. my knowledge now. So yeah, yeah, I did make money for a few different ways from what you taught me. Fantastic, good. And so um, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the different ways you found deals and how you funded them. I know you did some creative deals as well. Yeah. But just remind us, what were the, after the, the 10, well, 11, 12 months, what were the overall results you had achieved on Mastermind in terms of the amount you bought and the, the profit you were generating from those properties? Well, yeah, um, it, was, uh, it was a challenge. So I, I, you have this banner, which was, I took it as a real challenge, really. £100,000. Sorry, a million pounds of the property. Yeah, yeah in, in income. And I took it as a challenge. And um, I really went at this uh, yeah. after the first, you know, in the first six months. So by six months, I'd managed to hit that target. And I remember texting yeah. you on your ski trip. Um, yeah. And then at the end of it, unfortunately, my parents were both diagnosed with dementia towards the back end of the course. So I didn't do much after eight months other than kind of yeah. just maintain. But by the end of the course, uh, my my... I forget the number of properties, but the the, the valuation was 1.19 million yeah. um, with 114,000 pounds worth of income. Yeah. 140. Now, obviously, yeah. I don't need to know what you were earning when you left Cadbury's, but I guess that's probably more than you were earning from your pretty well-paid senior manager at corporate job. It was, yeah. 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 So, certainly when you think about tax and stuff, absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, so did you ever think, I mean, 50,000 pound is a, a target we set and you know, not everyone gets there. Obviously in the first, most people take two or sometimes three years to get there. Yeah. We get about 15 to 20% of people in the group who actually achieve that within the first year. Yeah. Did you think you would more than double that in 12 months? No, 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 I didn't. Um, I really didn't. I just looked at a target and I thought, well, if I can hit 50,000 in 12 months, then we're okay. You know, we, we, yeah. I have two, two children with and james heavily pregnant when i started mastermind yeah so we had two three children pretty much and i thought fifty thousand if we reduce all our outgoings and we cancel sky subscriptions all that kind of stuff yeah yeah fifty thousand will be enough to see us through and then you know try and build on that over time yes and obviously you you've you didn't stop there you've done more you've built more so your income is obviously more than that i know yes. now but yeah. that's what you did within 12 months, which is just, which is just yeah. phenomenal. So let's talk a little bit about um, how you funded some of that, first of all. So you had some redundancy. Yes. I yeah, I was looking at, I had a redundancy, which was around about 70, 80,000, something like that redundancy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had savings um, and share options and that kind of stuff. So the reality was I had a part of around about 140,000. Yeah, which is pretty good. I like always teach people at some point, especially the rate you're going at, you're going to run out of your own money at some point. It goes like that. <laughs> it really went, and it did. It went fast. You did say that in fairness. Yeah. Um, and I figured out, well, how many, how far will this go in terms of properties? Yeah. Um, and I quickly realized that even, you know, I had to use my network really. So yeah. the first property I bought was with three other people. And that was because yeah. I was concerned that with having no, no job anymore that I might not be viable for a mortgage. Yeah. So uh, I did a joint venture with three very close friends who yeah. uh, essentially had commercial experience and would be good collateral, if you like, for me to go to the yes. Bank. Yeah. Um, but the problem with it was great learning experience for me, but the reality was you're only going to get a quarter of the whole income yeah. um, for the quarter of the, of the amount of money you put in. So it was good, good starter. But, but then with my own money going to the next deal, um, I quickly realized then that that was my money gone because yeah. of the cost to get things done. And I need to start looking for, as you call them, sophisticated investors or, yeah. or people that you know in your network. And so it was one of those difficult situations where I had to use other people and then therefore yeah. I had to learn how to approach them. And with the kind of questions and approach you taught me, yeah. then these people became friends and it was family. And the reality was my mom and James, mom and dad yeah. and a close friend sourced that source sorry provided the funds for the next deal i did yes so it was my money into deal two my friend and family into deal three yeah and then, and then we started to use momentum investing where you're ideally adding value and then refinancing and putting as much as you can out as quick as possible yeah that's right yeah exactly right and and, and one of the things i learned there really son was that the second deal i did i used my money but it was a property that had had a lot of work done on it and it was a motivated seller so yeah. You know, this was this was a deal that changed my life really, and it brought all the things that you kind of taught into reality. That the theory became reality. Yeah. And I'll, I'll talk you through this deal if I can at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. 
helps paint the picture of, of, yeah. of how it kind of has shifted me from bloke who left Cadbury's concern he was going to do okay with a lot of motivation and, and built the knowledge into somebody who kind of got it and could layer that and then cut and paste all the way through to build a property portfolio which ended up with more than 12 properties yeah so um so yet yeah, one of the key things you told me was tell everybody what you do which I didn't want to do that work to Cadbury didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm some kind of hotshot property investor but um I just said I did it as a hobby, which is tip number one. Yes. Say you're happy. Everyone can have a hobby. It's fine because people that work at Capri have hobbies. And the further up your tree you go, then hobbies are acceptable. But doing another job isn't. So yes, exactly. Yeah. That is hobby. And my next door neighbor of all the people um, was on the board of a charity. The charity had fallen into difficulties because it was a, a, a refuge for domestic violence. They'd had funding cuts at the time. Uh, it, was, it was at the start of austerity and also been mismanaged. So they had to sell a property they bought quickly because they needed the funding and all the trustees were accountable for the, for the debts. Yeah. So my neighbour spoke to me, having told them I'm a property investor, she came to me and said, would you mind looking at this property? I need to believe that a neighbour that can help with my, my best deal I ever got. So I went and looked at it, realised that, that I could help them. Um, I could give them what they needed to move on and continue to provide the services that they were doing. Um, but also it was a, a sector I'd never even thought about going into, into the charitable sector. Yeah. By you do a really good service for one, you yeah. can essentially as an investor make decent money without having to get too involved. Cause once it's set yeah. up, you have a long lease and they look after it and manage it. Um, but also commercially it would refinance really, really well. So the, t- the second top tip, having told, you know, tell everyone what you do is, to then get a independent valuation of the property before you buy it. Because yeah. once I'd put the property in place and sourced the tenant, I could get a commercial valuation on that, which told me before I bought it, it would, it would scale up to be worth a lot more than yeah. I was going to pay for it. So I could give them what they needed. They can carry on doing the good work they did. I could buy the property knowing that with the tenants I wanted to get in place, I could refinance this and pull my money out and the investors' yeah. money. So great great deal for me i then kind of wrote to all of the uh, the local charities in the area to see who might want to take this on because the charity i was buying it from had had enough of properties they just wanted to do their own service <laughs> in the community yeah um i think it was a personal thing i don't think i offended them but they, they just knew where their skill set was i yeah. wrote to 196 different charities had a reply from two and of the one that i actually met at the property it wasn't suitable for her but she had a good contact who essentially was in domestic violence and homelessness. Yeah. Um, got them in, they loved it. And we then went on to do another 15 properties with them. So it's well, just... Let's, let's, sorry, go on, go on. I was like, it's just that one thing of telling the neighbour that led me not just to the property, but the idea that homeless people needed help. And yeah. there was some great people out there to work with who were providing help that's now scaled up to be a business where we've got over 100 units with Dan and Dave in nearly yeah. 40. And we've helped God knows how many homeless people get yeah. out of society. So from that one thing, it's just really scaled up to be. So I, I love this, Greg, because, you know, sometimes one of the reasons why people don't want to get into property or maybe get into HMOs mm. is because they think, well, an HMO is going to be more work, more management than a single. And yes, it is more work. But what you've done, you've basically, you're giving it to a charity who's kind of renting it from you. So they're giving you a guaranteed rent, pretty much the full rate you get. Not far because, off, yeah, not far off, yeah. yeah. Because they can rent it up, that they get a higher rate from the council because they're yeah. some vulnerable people. So they can make a profit and enough to survive. And, and so you're getting pretty close to the full market rent yeah. with no hassle, but also you're providing charity much needed uh, yeah. The charity much needed accommodation to get homeless people or people yeah. who are in difficult position off the streets, which yeah. is just a, a really worthy cause as well. It, it is it's fantastic, and we've met some of the tenants that that we've provided property for who just, you know, just like us in some respects, or, or they've had yeah. a difficult bring, upbringing and haven't had the, maybe the family support around them that we've we've enjoyed, and the joy of them going into that room. But yeah. it's, you know, we set it like a professional HMO. They go into that and they feel somebody cares. And it's that difference that helps them get over the problems that they're in immediately to be yeah. in a different, safe, warm space to restart their lives. And that's a massive feeling. It's a great feeling for us. And yeah, there's some really good stories of people that have now got their children back who weren't able to see them before. People have been yeah. to prison, come out again. It's just, yeah, it makes you feel good. But yeah. also it's, it's a good business as well. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's making a real impact, that, isn't it? 
yeah. and, and oh, it is. difference, yeah. but, but also being commercial as well. It's you're not running a charity, but you're supporting the charities yeah. who are doing all this good, and, and they wouldn't be able to do that if land was like you didn't give them the property. Uh. Benefit for you, helping helping the community, uh, great return on your investment, and, and just very little hassle. Yeah, absolutely right. But it's very little hassle, um, and you can build partnerships with these people. There are um, there are some dodgy operators out there. Yeah. So you know you have to do your homework, like anything. Find yeah. out who they are. Go out and meet these people. Look at their track record. Go and visit the properties they've got, and you get a real quick sense of who, who the professional yeah. investors are. I think it's important always to do your due diligence because yeah, absolutely there, right. there are some uh, unfortunately there are some charities who who mean well but they're just not run very efficiently. Not at all. Uh, and, and you no. don't want to give your property to one of those because if they can't then pay you, et cetera, yeah. that's a bit of a nightmare, right? Absolutely right. And also being an entrepreneur, you can, you can s help solve their problems. So yeah. part of the key for us was having fewer of their team that were going around different houses that were, were kind of dotted around where they could find willing landlords, you know, yeah. but to travel in, in between them to provide services to people. We, we kind of have clusters now where we buy properties so that yeah. you cut down on the staffing they need, which means they can then become more effective and, and efficient in how they provide their services. So it's understanding that side of it to help their business build as well with you. So yeah, it's um, quite, quite something to have come over a conversation with a neighbor with the knowledge and experience and, and support you, you gave me through the yeah. mastermind course. It means that we now help many, many other people. Fantastic. With their lives. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so obviously you, you uh, started doing properties on your own and then you, you joint yeah. ventured with Dan and Dave who you met yeah. on Mastermind. So did you have some property with them and some properties on your own or did you put them all into yeah. New Leaf or? Well, well, what happened was the master, my mastermind year um, effectively is my, my private, um, my, my, I guess my private business with Jane. So we've got our own properties there. And then we, we said to each other, look, let's start from now. If we, if we want to scale this up and help more people, we all put about 400,000 pounds in um, over time. But we then essentially put our own money in. We bought new properties through essentially a partnership agreement we all had. Yeah. Uh, whereby if I bought it, I put the money in, it was still a new leaf property, but it kind of was in my name, if that made Got sense. It, yeah. Um, which worked really well before the Section 24 changes yes. came in. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you have to adapt, don't you? So essentially, we, we all kind of bought properties in our own name. And then when that change came in, whereby we couldn't offset all of the, in, of the interest from the mortgages, yeah. we did the work which showed that it was more sensible for us to move into a company structure. Yeah. So Dave brilliantly managed that with his background of being a lord. Yeah. Um, he managed that process, got, uh, essentially moved from an LLP into an incorporated company. And so we, again, then refinanced the business and managed to what, make what was a tricky situation that from the law change into something that actually made, gave us the ability to get better funding at a lower price with Lloyd's. Yeah. So I mean, we actually made a bit more money per month yeah. as well. So. <laughs> how... how when things go wrong and section 24 is pretty bad for most investors right yeah you yeah. either look at look at how bad it is and worry about that or you just get on with it adapt and i think successful people adapt and they're flexible right yeah you have to be you have to be and this this game does seem to have changed i mean i've only been it since what 2014 professionally yeah but i've dabbled since 2003 and made a lot of mistakes before i kind of did your course and i made some since i've done the course but yeah there are fewer and, and, and not so severe yes but, what you do notice is there's massive change, a rate of change in the last few years in particular with legislation, be it around who your tenants are or yeah. how you can now account for your properties. Um, it's been huge and the planning changes, the licensing changes, there's a lot of change. And if you don't change, then you're going to fall behind or you're going to, it's going to cost you a lot of money. So you have to, to adapt and you have to work with people who are prepared to adapt as well. Fantastic. So let's talk a little bit more about how you found most of your deals while you're on Master. So obviously, word of mouth, you said, tell everyone what you do. Yeah. yeah. How did you find most of your deals? What were you doing? Um, it, it was a combination. Uh, again, property investment um, for me was about a career change. So I, I tried some leafleting. Yeah. I didn't have a lot of success with that. Um, but I did phone up people who were in the papers at the time, advertising through the way you taught yeah. us um, yeah. and asked them what they did with the deals that didn't work for them. Yeah. A couple of those guys. And then funny enough, that a couple of deals came from that. Yeah. Got to know some estate agents really well, um, who then set, set up another couple of deals for me. Uh, so word of mouth, speaking to people that were advertising at the time, getting to know agents really well, and even looking on Rightmove, 
but with a particular eye for what I wanted in areas that only worked for me that meant I could get some really good deals as well. So it wasn't all about buying below market value, which in 2003, four was what I was taught by people who didn't really know what they were doing. Yeah. Um, rising market, you know, you don't really get that. It was about understanding what was value to me. And even though something on right move may be full price, well, if I know I can make a lot more money from it as a multi-let than you can as a single house let, then I'm prepared to pay market yeah. price. I think a mistake sometimes some investors make is because they see something on right move a certain price and they think they have to buy below market value and they make yeah. an offer that just yeah. doesn't work for the seller. Whereas actually, if you know your market, sometimes yeah. things are priced well Absolutely. already or you can see the potential that other people can't see and thus you're prepared to pay the, the full asking price. That, that's exactly it. Yeah, don't, don't feel you've got to go and deliver when you've got it below market value. It doesn't matter what you pay for it because ultimately we believe that property will go up over time. Yeah, and because historically it does. So um, if you've got a secure investment whereby you know you can, you know, pay maybe five to ten thousand pounds more than somebody else, then why not do it? If you know you've got that property for 18, 20 years, yeah, it doesn't matter about the bit you paid extra there. It's the fact you've made a lot of money every year on it, and the value will go up over time. You have to think. Yes, about and we're not worried about short-term fluctuations when it comes up no. or down because it's the no. long-term trend. Yeah, it's long-term, and if you set it right to start with, you can get through these things, these these fluctuations. Yeah. So I think that's the key thing. The cash flow you talked about was making at least a thousand pounds per HMO. Yeah. You're trying to get it so you got at least six six rooms is a real real yes. key point really because you then have the confidence to ride out the bad times. Yeah. And I find it's I mean I've got a lot of five beds, but I find that extra room that is is pretty yeah. much all profit because it doesn't yeah. cost that much more in terms of bills. Yeah. So you know a five bed might make you five six hundred pounds. That extra room is going to top you over a thousand. Generally, I find. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's a nice comfort factor, isn't it? To, to have yeah. the extra room in there. And yeah. even if you've got a big five bed, can you, I know you have to be careful now about room sizes, but can you find in your existing property an extra room? So you've got five rooms. I know you've done this, you've gone through yes. your property. Can you add a six yeah. room anyway? And if not, how do you make it so that people want to stay there longer? How do you make it to be a much Why better living it? space and all the facilities you provide? So yeah. there's ways you can adapt your business model, whether you've got five or six rooms, that mean it pays very well, you reduce your voids, and then you've got that longevity you need to be riding through the rougher times. Yeah, and we talked a little bit about, obviously you funded deals through some of your own money and releasing X in your property and you've gone out to family and friends. Did you use any creative strategies, such as lease options or rent did, plan, yeah. finance? Or yeah, that was one of the ones I wanted to tick off on that on the process flow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I did, so I've done two purchase lease options um, yeah. whereby I sourced, and again, this is one of those things where I never wanted to buy a flat. It was not part of my strategy, but I met a guy who um, was through the sourcer who was advertising in the paper who yeah. had a flat, wanted to move on with his partner. They, they kind of got together. He was a singleton before, bought the flat, got together with his partner, it was too small for them too, wanted to move on and get a house. It was in negative equity with a Northern Rock mortgage, you know, yeah. through the, the difficulty yeah, yeah. of 2008. So long story short, it worked in terms of the criteria for a purchase lease option. And I took over that property, rented it out for a, for a number of years. And then I had a really good relationship with him because, I, you know, we, we just got on as, as characters and we were trustworthy. Uh, and we had the legal documentation there, which meant that he understood what a purchase lease option was. And he phoned me up the one day and said, you know, the property the prices have gone up. So that flat that you now bought from me, in theory, yeah. an option at, at, I think it was £76,000 was the debt he had on it. Um, it's now worth £117,000. And I, and I couldn't wait to get out of it because it, <laughs> it, it only made about £100 a month. And absolutely, <laughs> I've only done this to learn how you do a proper purchase lease option. So I could say I've yeah. done one, yeah. which is not great advice. But um, <laughs> it, in the end, after three years, it, it made a lot of money through selling it to the guy who basically had done the PLO with, phoned him up and said, if you want to sell it, sell it now. It's worth a lot more than you think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was worth doing. Uh, that was the first one. Uh, the yeah. best one I did was a property whereby, um, again, it was a friend of a friend, really. So talking about sourcing properties, tell everyone what you do. Do yeah. it with credibility. Help them as much as you can. Don't expect anything back from them. And then people yeah. come to you then. Absolutely. They know you're credible. They know you're trustworthy. And you will help them out of your situation if you can through advice. Yeah, and if you can't help them, and sometimes they just want to get rid of it, then great, you're there to be a safe pair of hands with credibility to deal with it. So this other one was about uh, a lady who lived in his house in Warsaw, um, 
who was going to have to move out. All of all the support structure was around her family, friends, that kind of thing, but was going to have to go into a care home because her son had to sell a property. So long story short, that was the second one I did, yeah. um, which has worked out pretty well so far. So yeah. we'll there we go. But they, they are fantastic tools to use. I know Dave, business partner Dave, he did a brilliant one in Erdington with a six or seven bed property. Where yeah, that's right, yeah. You're just buying it this year. So yeah, they are great tools to use. But in terms of deal sourcing, yeah, I just look at the playbook, use yeah. them all. Um, and, and set yourself with a mindset that if you just play one channel, you might get some decent crops. But if you set, yeah. if you kind of play a number of, of channels, you yeah. sow a lot more seed. Okay. You you, lot more crop. You'll find the ones that, where right, you say leaflets didn't particularly work well for you, but yeah. you know, there are other ones that did, you know. So it's a case of trying yeah. them and seeing which resonate with you, yeah? Yeah, and, and I'm a creator, so I'm quite, I get bored of things, don't I? Yeah. Um, yes. And I have to work hard. Once the idea is done and it's set up, I get a bit bored of it. So for me, yeah. leafleting is you need the right mindset for that to keep going and going and going. So yeah. I just thought, well, I'm getting loads of leaflets come through. I'll phone these people up who are doing leafleting really well. Yeah. See if it doesn't work for them. Yeah. See if I can take their deals, you know, work with them to kind of pay them for the for the leads and and that's worked as well. So it's about knowing your strengths too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So look, Greg, you're giving us lots of hints and tips and things. So uh, and so one of them was like, tell everyone what you do. Have you got kind of like a quick summary of some advice that you would give people if they want to kind of emulate the success that you've had? Um, yeah, I, I'd say really simply, um, be, be really clear what you want from your life because I, I was 20 years in the corporate world and I genuinely enjoyed it for, say, the first 15, um, but wanted to get out and you wanted to get out, spend more time with family and friends. So be really clear about why you want to leave your corporate job and what yeah. you want to do with your time afterwards. So that's number one. Yeah. And my motivation was more time with family and friends. It was simple, really. So that was my reason why. And I think if you lock it in there and it means something to you, it will really kind of motivate you from a, an emotional perspective to get yes. through the tough times. And there are lots of tough times in property. Yeah, yeah it's not easy, is it? We make that very clear. No, no, absolutely right. It, it, Not easy, just, but if you're right, if you have that, if you have that really clear reason why, and it's a strong yeah. reason why, you're going to be far more motivated to keep going. Absolutely, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So the tough times help you through the difficulties. Um, so that's, that'd be tip number one. Know why you're doing it. I think tip number two is don't be scared to educate yourself. Um, I looked at property, and when I did mastermind in 2014, I thought it's a fortune. I spent a fortune to do the course. Yeah. Well, bloody hell. It, what value that was it, it's, I think it was 14,000 pound plus VAT at the time yeah it's a lot uh, more now well it's a lot more now but it seemed yeah. a lot then <laughs> so, <laughs> was years. I looked at this as I got a degree in engineering which took me four yeah. years and god knows how much it cost my parents but if you yeah. look at it as a career change then then spend the time and the money to invest in your own education because now six seven years on I'm using the things I learned in that year it's paid many 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 times over yeah and I know that, you know, I think we're going to go through a rough time now with recession and maybe deeper. But yeah. I know that there will come a time when I'll just flip these skills on again and then go yeah. and get more deals, more property. So it will pay forever. Work hard for one year yeah. and get paid forever, which I know you use. And obviously having so, knowledge yeah. and the confidence and the ability, you, you've got that skill so you can get a return on that investment for life, right? Well, absolutely for life, yeah. yeah. And, it, and to be honest, I had a great time at university, but I'd rather have learned this then uh, and put it yeah. in practice when I was 20, 23 than, yeah. than when I was you know, 43. <laughs> so that'd be the other tip. I think um, just build your network around you because it's hard to do this on your own. So yeah. get amongst like-minded people who are also have the same goals you do. Learn from each other. Share you know, gen generously with people. This is a bit of a cult, this, this you know, mastermind <laughs> network. It That's been that called way. that sometimes, yeah. It, it seems that way too, but genuinely people come into this arena and they share because they've either been where you are and learned from other people that help them, yeah. um, or, they're, or they're looking to learn and they've got some other skill they can bring to it. So be really open-minded to share yeah. your advice, share your knowledge, build your network, and then, you know, be an active operator in that network in a really yeah. credible an open way because I think I mean, Cad Cadbury's where we were w was a very friendly environment yeah. Yeah. but I think people who come from corporate generally really struggle with that yeah. abundance yeah. because normally if you help someone in a corp it it's to their advantage you might hold you back Absolutely. so it's, it's difficult to get used to that isn't it yeah knowledge is power in the corporate world um and therefore people protect it 
because because it's that scarcity mentality and as you've just quite rightly said have that mindset of abundance where there are loads of properties out there there are loads yeah. of people that know what they're doing and you know they're great to work with and you will find them if you go out with the right attitude um so have that mindset share with others help them and you'll find it'll come back to you you know the universe has a way of helping you get to where you want if you've got the right attitude towards other people um and then once you set your goal once you're really clear about why you're doing it and what you want to achieve just go and do it <laughs> yeah get the knowledge and get out there and work hard and do not stop until you, you have, have achieved certainly your first goal and maybe a second target and then maybe a third target um so yeah my advice would be just be really clear get the knowledge get the right network around you and be an active operator in, in that network and then just go and do it just go and Fantastic. do it and enjoy it as well and the other thing i'd say is don't worry about people out there who did a mastermind who've taken up all the properties most people do this for a period of time and then they're happy they stop yeah they get enough and they they get on with what they want to do in their life right yeah the whole point is i mean i don't really like houses that much i mean <laughs> they're good they're useful when it's raining of course but I just wanted the lifestyle that it provides. Yeah. So, so let's, let's talk about that because the final thing I was going to ask you, how, how has this experience changed your life? And I, I do know because obviously we know each other quite well, but yeah. just for some people watching this video, what's it done for you in terms of the lifestyle? How's it well, changed your life? Apart from, it's given, it's given me security really. It's given me freedom, I'd say. My, my values are about fun, freedom, and family. It kind of comes in that, you know, that family isn't a value, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Spending time influencing my children's life as much as I can. I'm a football coach for them all. Um, I coach yeah. my little boy's team with, with a friend of mine, um, I, which means that I can be there to set up training each night of the week without having to worry about a boss keeping me late and yeah. having to travel elsewhere. Um, spend time with Jane. We have that because we're getting a bit older now and we've got, you know, three boys who really do tire us out yeah our date nights don't happen so we, we have a wednesday afternoon where we go and do what we want together um yeah. and the grandparents have the kids from school when, when we're in normal life this is not like that yeah but yeah when when we have that normality to choose when we go and do what we want i can go i can take them to school i can go to their assemblies i can watch them in the wind band i've seen all their activities i haven't missed anything i haven't wanted to miss yeah um, and you know what most most parents who are in a corporate life they miss all of that. They do, and I feel guilty about it. It's that yeah. guilt, not being with the kids and then not getting the work done. It's like a triangle of guilt, isn't it, in a way, with yeah. family, work, uh, and your own personal needs. And it's a tough one, but this gives you the freedom to kind of apportion your time appropriately there. Um, and so, so I'm lucky to have found that balance. And, and yeah, one really important thing to me is my parents were both diagnosed with uh, dementia in the back end of my mastermind year, and I got to spend time with them you know to kind of be with them when it was really important to me to be there yeah. for them when otherwise i wouldn't be able to do that and fortunately they died a, you know a couple of years ago now but i had that time with them um and well, that's no, priceless isn't it yeah you can yeah it is priceless so the freedom to do what you want to go on holidays you want but also to just do nothing as well <laughs> what are doing? They don't do it now <laughs> <laughs> I do. so yeah i've loved it and, and the other thing is just learning new skills new tricks i mean the thing about i learned late was that in corporate world i had this attitude and, and maybe i'm alone in this but i had this attitude i've got my degree i've climbed the ladder um and therefore you don't need to learn any more do you i might do a microsoft course or whatever else but or a risk assessment course but you don't need to learn lots and and I've, how wrong was that so ever since i've done mastermind i've gone on and learned the merger and acquisitions course to learn about yes. businesses and how they work and as you, yeah. well, you were there we did it together yeah yeah um so i've got not knowledge there that I've, i can use and do use uh, occasionally trading course i've looked learned crypt like cryptocurrencies and the risks associated there but also the opportunities yeah global macroeconomics i've done a lot of work in the last year and a half about how the financial world works i was never interested in any of this but it's yeah. just another market to me now another opportunity yeah. and, and it's fascinating and especially what to learn especially what's happening with the, the world economy yeah. now, yeah. there's going to be some very interesting, it's going to be tough times for many people, but there's going to be great opportunities as well. And so having that slightly different perspective is going to really prepare you to maybe take advantage of some, some other opportunities as they come up. Uh, absolutely right. And, and it does, whether it's from an investment point of view, I'm moving my pension now, alas, my, my final salary uh, pension scheme from Cadbury, which everyone says it's a, you know, it's a divine benefit scheme. Don't yeah. change it. Well, yeah. I've now realized the way the gilt market's gone and the bond market, a valuation that I had in 2016 is more than doubled. Yeah. So guess what? 
and now moving into a SaaS, which means that yeah, so annuities are very low. So actually, transfer mm -hmm. values out are really high at really? The time of recording this. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's put a date stamp on it. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. first quarter, <laughs> uh, actually, just in the second quarter of 2020. But yeah, yeah, at this point in time, it's the right thing for me to do. I'm not a financial advisor, but so I'm moving that. So that knowledge, that ability to do things like that, to learn more things, has meant I've moved it. So so my pension's worth more than it was. And guess what? And I back up my business through the difficult time. So if Lloyd's ever pull out the loans, which they have done, you know, previously uh, in the last crash, I can use my SaaS to invest into my, my corporate property. So there's lots of things yeah. I can do now where I provide that long term security for the family just because I've had that mindset, thanks to you and, and you know, the network you've created to continually learn lifelong education. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I, the more I, I love learning, I love growing, I love coming mind stimulated. And yeah. I found the more I invest in myself, the more successful I become. Yeah, so true. Yeah, absolutely right. So yeah, yeah that's hopefully that's been helpful to people to to kind of. Well, yeah, Greg, it's help. been an absolute pleasure to hear. I mean, I know your story very well because we're old friends. But you know, it's I'm so pleased to. And for me, you touched on it as you said. It's not so much about the property. The property's mm. great, but actually, it's mm. what that allows you to do. That security you have the freedom, the time to the kids with your parents. And I say, I know yeah. that's absolutely priceless. And so yeah. I'm really pleased that you've done so well. And I thank you for putting your trust in us and just following the process, trusting the process. Yeah. You, know, you, you just did what you were told. You kept on going, got great results. And I'm sure yeah. everyone watching this has got real massive inspiration and loads of golden nuggets. So once again, Greg, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Great talk to you, Simon. And thank good you. luck, everyone.